There are many churches today that look beautiful on the outside, but are dead on the inside. As we look at the second part of the letters to the seven churches today in the book of Revelation, we see at least a couple of churches that fit that description. We also are encouraged by at least one church that has been able to endure persecution and to be faithful to the very end. I invite you to join us today as we look at the book of Revelation to be both challenged and encouraged. I hope you'll be blessed. And if you have your Bible, please turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Jesus says, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot out his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down at your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you, because you have kept my word about patient endurance." I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name, he who has an ear, Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him, and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Well, if I were asked to sum up the foundation of Christianity in one word, I would use the word Emmanuel, God with us. We sing about that at Christmas time, but it isn't just a word that should be relegated to that time of year. The Son of God, in taking on human flesh and becoming a man, came to live among men and die as a man for the sake of our sins, so that we who believe in him would have a relationship with God. To have a relationship with God not only means that God is no longer against us, but that God is near us. He dwells in individual believers by the Holy Spirit. And he stands in the midst of the body of believers every time it gathers together to worship him. So God was not only with his people who dwelt on the earth in the first century, he is also with us here and now. That is, to all who let him in. When we look at these letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, 
What we're looking at is a sort of progress report of what's going on in each church in their relationship to God. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And how each church is doing determines the nature of Jesus' presence. We've seen so far in Revelation that this book is actually one big prophetic letter that's written to the church as a whole, the words of which come straight out of the mouth of Jesus. We're told in chapter 1 that the Apostle John begins having a series of visions while exiled on the island of Patmos, just off the coast of modern-day Turkey. And the first vision vision he sees is Jesus in all his glory, standing in the midst of seven lampstands and holding seven stars in his right hand. A little later, we're told that the seven lampstands symbolize seven churches, and the seven stars represent the seven messengers to each church. John is told to write what he sees to to the churches, which includes the full content of the book of Revelation from start to finish. But it also includes very particular messages to seven churches in first century Asia, as we see in chapters 2 and 3. Now, we should not try to allegorize each of these churches or say that each church represents a different phase in church history like some commentators do. These are seven real churches that actually existed when John wrote Revelation. So we should treat them as addressing very specific historical circumstances. But with that said, we should also be careful not to think that these seven messages have no relevance at all for us in the 21st century. It's not hard to notice that the number seven pops up repeatedly throughout Revelation, which, by the way, is a number that we saw a lot in John's Gospel as well. The number seven in Scripture is often used symbolically, usually to represent perfection or fullness. So while the letters were originally for seven specific churches, we can be confident that the number seven is not arbitrary, that it stands for the fullness of the Christian church in all times and all places. Another common mistake that readers of Revelation make in regards to the seven letters is that they read the first three chapters of the book as if they have nothing to do with the rest of the book, as if there's some sort of thing that's tacked on at the beginning as an afterthought. But if we read carefully, we can see that these letters are what Pastor Mark Dever calls a front-loaded application for the rest of the book. These seven messages that we see in chapters 2 and 3 are the key to the rest of this book. Because it's in these letters that we find the main themes and the main point that runs through the entire narrative. And the main point is that the church of Jesus Christ overcomes Satan and the world in the same way that Jesus did, through faithfully enduring suffering and persecution, even unto death. And the church as a whole is promised that it will overcome the world because Jesus already has. As Jesus told Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus struck the death blow against Satan, sin, and death when he died on the cross and rose again. And it was at that time that the kingdom of God in seed form was established on earth. And the victory of that kingdom over the world cannot be stopped because Jesus, the Almighty God, is its king. That's the main point of Revelation, and the rest of the book is a dramatic portrayal of those central truths. So we shouldn't think of Revelation so much as a detailed account of the end times, but as something more like a work of art that draws us into the way in which God is already operating in the world for his glory, and for the victory of his people. So today we're going to look at the last three churches in the list, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And we'll see that two of them have a similar problem that has put them in dire straits, while one of them is enduring faithfully. And we can be sure that Jesus' message to each of these churches has something to say to us as well. So with that, we'll look at the first of the churches, Sardis and Laodicea, 
We'll look first at those two churches, and then lastly at the church of Philadelphia. The city of Sardis was well regarded in the ancient world. Like Ephesus, it was a city within the Roman Empire of great wealth and fame, which was all too comfortable with the Roman ways of pagan worship. Remember that not only was the worship of God's common practice in Asia Minor, but also the worship of the emperor, which was starting to be strictly enforced by the time John was writing this letter. That's why he was exiled onto Patmos. But with all that pagan idolatry and veneration of Rome going on, the church in Sardis seems to have been strangely comfortable in that setting. In fact, Jesus doesn't give them any kind of commendation for how they've handled living in such an ungodly society. What he does give them is an immediate rebuke starting in the second part of verse 1. He says, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Now it seems that the church in Sardis was a little bit too at home in the world, to the point of being practically dead. By this point in time, they were just running on the fumes of their reputation for having been a spiritually vibrant church at some point in the past, when the reality was they were far from it. We're not told specifically what had caused their church to fall into a spiritual coma, but it seems to have been a combination of sin and complacency. They had a lack of conviction, therefore the works they performed were half-hearted, lacking in the fullness of obedience. So Jesus tells them to wake up, to repent, and hold on to what they already knew to be true, and to live in light of that truth. Jesus gives them a stern warning. If they don't wake up, he's going to come in judgment against them. And his coming will be like that of a thief, because they're in such a stupor that they won't even expect it. Now, even though Jesus uses the language here of coming like a thief, I don't think he's referring to the second coming. For one thing, Jesus obviously did not return in bodily form in the first century. And remember that scripture uses the language of God coming or visiting a people, and in this case a church, when it is being disobedient and in need of correction. So Jesus is threatening the church of Sardis with the prospect of his coming to judge them through his spirit and through the various events that God might orchestrate to discipline them. But we should notice that Jesus hasn't completely written the church off, at least not everyone within the church. Let's continue reading in verse 4. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot out his name out of the book of life. So there is a remnant in Sardis. There are a group of believers within the church that are staying faithful even when the church as a whole seems to be assimilating into the rest of pagan society. I don't think it's a coincidence that in the Greek text, the word name appears four times in this message to Sardis. In verse 1 in the ESV, it says you have the reputation of being alive, but the actual word there is name. Then in verse 4, it says you still have a few names who have not soiled their garments. And in verse 5, I will never blot out his name from the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So why this emphasis on the concept of name? Well, in the ancient world, your name was closely tied to your identity. But those who are true believers find their identity in Christ. And maybe that's why scripture talks about believers receiving a new name at the end of history. And of course, those who aren't Christians find their identity in the many different options that the world wants to provide. The issue of a person's identity is possibly the central issue in public discourse today. And it seems that everyone wants to be acknowledged and treated according to the identity that they've chosen for themselves. 
In an obvious way, the overemphasis on one's identity can lead to people wanting to choose what gender they want to be. But it also plays itself out in more subtle ways, like a person finding their identity solely in their race, or in their social class, or their political views, or their career, or their hobbies. If you're a Christian, all of those things are going to contribute to your identity, but they are not the core of your identity. Your core identity is found in Christ and in him alone. So apparently there was a small remnant of believers in Sardis who held on to that identity and weren't suckered into thinking that the identities of the world had to, had to offer were more desirable. Those in the church who didn't hold on to their identity in Christ gave in to the culture and probably decided not to speak up when it came to their faith so that they could blend in and be popular. Notice that there is not a word about persecution or tribulation in this message to Sardis, as there was in the letter to Smyrna or even to the letter to Pergamum. Apparently the church in Sardis was doing such a good job of blending into their pagan society that they didn't even cause much of a stir. There was a sizable Jewish population in Sardis, but there's no mention of any conflict between the church and the synagogue. Conflict with the culture is not always a good thing, but it can be an indicator that a church is doing what it was put there to do, to be a witness of Jesus in a dark world. And sometimes being a witness offends the world around us and causes it to be hostile to the church. Of course, that's not a warrant for us to go out and start picking fights, but it is something that we should think about, especially when we find ourselves getting too comfortable, too complacent in the world. A fear of man is one of the primary tools that Satan uses to try and silence the church's witness. And we can get so concerned about not wanting to offend anyone for fear of backlash and ridicule. But in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus once told his disciples not to fear those who might malign and mock and persecute. He said this, What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father." But even the hairs on your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. And what does Jesus say in Revelation 3, verse 5, about the one who overcomes? I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. If we openly profess our faith in Christ to the world, then Jesus is going to joyfully profess the faithfulness of our names to God in heaven. But to those who don't repent, to those who just continue to blend into the world, he will say at the end of their lives, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Matthew 7, 23. All those who find their true identity in Jesus Christ will never have to hear those chilling words. Their names will not be blotted out of the book of life. Let's move on now to the letter to the church in Laodicea. Starting in verse 15, Jesus says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Laodicea was one of the wealthiest cities in Asia. Like Sardis, it was a well-regarded city, known for three things in particular, its banking, its textile industry, and its medical school. And we'll see each of those three things come into play a little bit later. And like most prominent cities in that region, region of Asia, it was known for its pagan temples to Greek and Roman gods. 
So one would expect that the Christian church there would find itself in constant opposition to its surrounding culture. But just as with the church in Sardis, the church in Laodicea seems to have grown comfortable, complacent. They had spent years feeding off the wealth of their city, and along with that, they'd apparently adopted the same sense of self-sufficiency of their city. Laodicea was very proud of the fact that it could take care of itself. At one point in history, it even refused funding from the Roman government after a massive earthquake. They believed that they were wealthy enough to rebuild it themselves, and they did. But we can expect a prosperous pagan city to have that kind of attitude. Yet we should never expect the church to have that kind of attitude. And of course, that's the sort of attitude that we find in most quarters of the world today. The prime example of which is right here in America. The American virtues are self-determination and self-sufficiency. Americans like to think that we can determine our own destinies, and then we have within our power, we have it within our power to do it. The poem Invictus, written by William Ernest Henley, seems to encapsulate that attitude to a T. It reads like this. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I think whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Now, it's interesting to note that William Henley died at a relatively young age. As it turns out, he was not the master of his own fate, and neither are any of us. But that poem could easily be the creed of our modern society. The modern assumption is that with enough wealth and knowledge and the right technology, we can achieve anything. We can even cheat death. Yet the sin of thinking oneself absolutely self-sufficient is, just, is not just a modern one. It's one that's been with us since the fall. And of course, as we look at history, one of the most obvious places we can see it is in the prosperous cities of the Roman Empire. So the pride and the sense of self-determination that defined the city of Laodicea had infiltrated and infected the Laodicean church causing it to become an impotent and lackluster congregation, a lukewarm congregation. And such lukewarmness is disgusting to God. Jesus uses the graphic analogy of tepid water that has been spewed out of his mouth. And this is one of those instances where knowing the historical context allows us to have a proper understanding of what's being said here. At first glance, Jesus seems to be saying that the Laodicean church has neither a white-hot passion for God, nor is it absolutely cold and aloof to God. It's somewhere in the middle and therefore unacceptable. But the reason why this analogy works so well with the city of Laodicea is that they were a city without an adequate water supply. Therefore, they had to pipe in their water from other regions through aqueducts. So by the time the water reached the city, it was dirty and tepid and pretty much undrinkable. New Testament scholar G.K. Beale notes that it was generally held to be true in the ancient world that cold and hot water or wine were beneficial for one's health, but not water which was lukewarm. So in this passage, it's not that hot is good and cold is bad, and that lukewarm is just somewhere in between but rather that both hot and cold are good and lukewarm is absolutely detestable. Now that allows us to see just how terrible the situation was in the Laodicean church. They weren't simply half-hearted or merely lacking in certain areas. They were a church that was a church in name alone. They had pretty much shut the spirit of Jesus out of the church. They were presumably a church that sang about and spoke about Jesus, but they weren't a church that had a relationship with Jesus. 
And these warnings to the churches in Sardis and Laodicea are just as much of a warning to the modern American church. For the most part, churches in America are comfortable, prosperous, and in some places, growing. But growth and prosperity is not a barometer of faithfulness. There are a lot of megachurches in America that aren't preaching the true gospel. And that's not a knock against large churches. It's just a caution for all Christians to not immediately equate worldly success with faithful ministry. The church in Laodicea was certainly successful by the world standards, but God was so very close to removing their lampstand and showing them just how spineless and spiritless they had become. So the trap of Satan that the Laodicean church had fallen into is one that we need to take to heart as American Christians. It can be so easy to play act with religion. We can go to church every Sunday and read our Bibles and pray and post scripture verses on social media and still not really have a relationship with Jesus. It's possible to live an outwardly religious life and yet be spiritually dead. And that's the problem that every one of the Laodicean Christians was facing. Notice that he doesn't even mention a remnant here, as he did with the church in Sardis. He could find none who were righteous, none who truly knew Jesus. So the Laodicean church would need to repent. But how could they repent? How could they undergo such a radical change? Well, Jesus tells them in verse 18. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Now we can see here that Jesus is making good use of irony. Remember that the city of Laodicea was known for its banking, its clothing, and its expertise in medicine. So Jesus forces them to see the folly in their sense of self-sufficiency by telling them that they are actually poor, and they needed gold, white garments to clothe themselves, and medicine for the blindness of their eyes. And of course, those aren't literal objects that Jesus is suggesting that they buy, but symbols of spiritual realities that can only be received from Christ. To be truly rich is to have an inheritance in Jesus. To be truly clothed clothed is to be wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus. To truly see is to see God's truth by the illumination of Jesus. Then look what Jesus says in verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Now, a lot of times this verse is used in evangelistic contexts in which the person sharing the gospel says that Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart, so you need to let him in. And while that is true, in a sense, that's not exactly what this text is talking about. The picture that Jesus is painting here is that of a master knocking on the door of his own house. In other words, he's already he already owns the house that he's knocking on, but the house guests have locked him out. So if the church in Laodicea had its own church building, Jesus is depicting himself as knocking on their church door, asking to be let back in. All the things that Jesus told them that they needed, the gold, the white garments, the eye medicine, could only be obtained by having a true, authentic relationship with him. We can't expect to have spiritual gifts without having a relationship with the only one who can provide those gifts. Yet the Laodiceans had practically shut Jesus out of the church and said, we don't need you. We have our own wealth and our religion. Thank you very much. But despite that attitude, Jesus still wanted to have a relationship with them. He had not yet given up on them. Verse 19 says, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Jesus loves his lost sheep. And if you're one of those lost sheep, he continually holds out an invitation to come to him. To have a soul-saving, soul-satisfying relationship with him. 
Let's move on now to the last church that we'll look at, which is actually the second one that's addressed here in chapter 3, the church in Philadelphia. Now, of the three in this chapter, the Philadelphian church is the only one which Jesus has exclusively positive things to say. So whereas in the Laodicean church, we had the image of a closed door, in the Philadelphian church, we have an image of an open door. Starting in verse 7, we read, The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. So as the Messiah who is in the line of King David, Jesus is the only one who has the authority to let people in to God's kingdom. And Jesus has found the church in Philadelphia to be faithful. So he sets before them an open door that leads to eternal life and to the eternal presence of King Jesus. In verse 9, we have another reference to the synagogue of Satan, which we saw last week in chapter 2 to the, in the letter to Smyrna. Now, once again, that's a reference to Jews who were persecuting Christians and informing against them to the Romans. It's not a reference to the Jewish people as a whole, but rather to the demonic influence that was manifesting itself through the sporadic Jewish persecutions. So we see that unlike the churches of Sardis and Laodicea, the church in Philadelphia was actually having to endure hardship and persecution for their faith. And compared to the churches of Sardis and Laodicea, Philadelphia was small, with not nearly as much influence or wealth. Yet it was enduring and remaining faithful with what little it had. Remember that the way Jesus tells the church to conquer is not through carnal or worldly means, but by the power of the Spirit and the Word, by the faithful witnesses of Jesus, witness of Jesus pushing back the spiritual darkness in the world. And that's precisely what the church in Philadelphia was doing. Verse 10. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. Now, once again, I don't think this hour of trial is referring to an end-time event because this was a message specifically for first-century Philadelphia and more broadly to the first-century churches in Asia Minor. The trial that was going to come upon the whole world was probably a way of referring to the large-scale persecution within the Roman Empire that would take place under the emperor Domitian. And Jesus doesn't say that he's going to spare the Philadelphian church from the physical effects of this trial, but that he's going to keep them as they faithfully endure it. Jesus used the same sort of language in John 17, 15. He said in his prayer to God the Father, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. So Jesus wasn't saying to the church in Philadelphia that he would would give them a get-out-of-tribulation free card, but that they would be strengthened spiritually in the midst of tribulation so that they would not fall away, and that they would eventually attain the victory crown of eternal life. But that's not the only reward. Look at what else says Jesus says at the beginning of verse 12. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Now Jesus is obviously using symbolic language here. He's not talking about a literal pillar, and he's not talking about a physical temple. Remember that the primary way God manifested his presence to ancient Israel was first through the tabernacle, then through the temple. God was even said to dwell in the temple. And of course, that doesn't mean that God was somehow confined within the four walls of a building. God is omnipresent. Rather, it was a way of saying that God was with the people of Israel in a very close and special way. They had a relationship with him that was based on an unbreakable covenant, which no other nation had. So before the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ, there was the incarnation of God in the Jewish temple. 
But the time of the Jewish temple and the sacrificial system that goes with it ended when the Son of God became a man, died on a cross, and rose from the dead. From that time on, the true temple of God is not that which is made by human hands, but rather that which is found in Christ. And we learned last week that Christ came not to build another temple, but to build a church, to build a community of God on earth. And the new temple would not be an earthly one, but it would be Jesus himself. He is where all sacrifice and worship finds its fulfillment. Jesus didn't do away with the concept of the temple. He is the temple. And as the Spirit of Jesus indwells each one of us, we become temples of God in a derivative sense. Ephesians 2.22 says, In Christ you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Faithful churches, churches that endure hardship and persecution, have the honor of being pillars in the true temple of God, which is found in the person of Jesus Christ. So that means that the church as a whole is a manifestation of God's presence and glory in the world. When the world looks at the church, it should be seeing Jesus. The church should be able to say the same thing that Jesus once said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So we see as the church of Jesus here in the 21st century that we are called to conquer. But we're not called to conquer with worldly weapons. We're not called to conquer with the sword of man, but rather with the sword of the Spirit. We're not called to rely on worldly wealth, but on the spiritual wealth that comes from God. And that kind of weaponry and wealth, amount, what that amounts to is the power to faithfully endure. To be a light in the world that is not dimmed or put out. To overcome the world just as Jesus overcame the world. But we can't live up to that calling if we're keeping Jesus at arm's length. The very core of our Christian lives should be our relationship with Jesus, not the various kinds of identities that we can attach ourselves to in the world. Before I close today, I want to give just four practical things that we can do to be a faithful church of Jesus. In no particular order, the first is to let go of the idol of self-sufficiency. None of us are the master of our own destiny or the captain of our own soul. We can do nothing worthwhile in and of ourselves. It's only by the blood of Jesus and the spirit of Jesus that we can do anything sufficient. The second thing we must do is to pray for revival. May we never become a lukewarm church or a dead church. And of course, our own innovation is not going to prevent that. The only thing that can is the spirit of the living God, enlivening each one of us. We worship a big God who can accomplish anything. Therefore, our prayers should be big prayers. The third thing we must do is fight our individual sins. Now, notice that I didn't say fight other people's sins. It's not your job to go around pointing out other people's sins. No, fight your own sins so that they don't hinder you from being a faithful member of the church. John Owen once said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. We should be treating sin in our lives as a disease that needs to be gotten rid of as soon as possible. And lastly, we need to be spurring each other on within the church to love and good works. The church gathering should be a time of encouragement and equipping so that we can go out into the world and shine brightly. If you have words of encouragement or even loving words of correction, don't hesitate to hold them back from a brother or sister in Christ. We need to be building each other up and making each other stronger so that we can endure faithfully when times get hard. Next week, we're going to be looking at chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation. So I encourage you to read those this week. And like I've said before, don't be too concerned with trying to decipher all the symbols, but simply allow yourself to read what's in front of you. 
And don't allow yourself to get discouraged if you don't understand something. Remember that the book of Revelation is written to bless us. And it does that by showing us who Jesus is and what his good and perfect plan are for the world and especially for the church. So as we continue studying this book, may we continue to have ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches.